Oh, okay, that did work. Um, I, I gotta notice that it's not gonna be recorded because I'm out of like space. I guess I guess I gotta like, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't I even know these things normally get recorded. I mean, obviously recorded through uh, YouTube, but it won't be recorded to my hard drive or to Google mm. Drive because I guess I I need free up space. But anyways, uh, welcome. We're doing a, a, a impromptu. Uh, oh shoot, why am I getting feedback? Uh, I don't hear feedback. I hear yeah, you. It's not my, maybe. It's, it's on my end. Yeah, I think so. May your YouTube um, channel went live at the same time, and maybe that's where the feedback's coming from. There you go. I have fixed it. So, anyways, we're doing a prop two after show. We just had done talking about reactors and a little bit about volcanoes on the non sequitur show. Uh, Landon wants to do a kind of a Q and A, so you guys can maybe ask some questions. If you guys want to come on in, the link is above. So, anyways, welcome. It's Streamyard, so we can determine who wants to come in and who doesn't. Um, got a super chat already for five dollars for my fitness journey. Currently doing orientation for my first job in a new career. Congratulations, dude! Uh, this was an awesome way to cap off what's already been a great week. Ooh, I'm glad you guys liked uh, that stream. It was a uh, a lot, of, a lot of preparation went into that for for two for two two and a half hours worth of streaming on two reactors because there's a lot to talk about to get out and condense it down to where it's digestible where a person can kind of get an idea of what happened in each reactor and why it was so significant um, the not only the inherent design flaws of the reactor but it's also the the stupidity of the people involved and the the absolute ineptitude that these people had in order to do such a thing as when they're in charge of this type of reactor system. Uh, so no. I, I, it was a combination of different things. So, and, um, I, have a, I have a question. Right? I'll start off with the first question um, for Landon. Please. So, um, in this situation, maybe for Steve also, like, do you guys do any emergent uh, practice, any drills or something like that, um, <clears throat> where you play out certain scenarios and then, um, and was this a something similar that has been practiced before or not? Oh, oh yeah, I, I mean, all the time they're running drills, and these are. Um, the way you do an emergency drill is this: um, you basically the, <laughs> there's there's a reality and then there's theory. The yeah. theory is you're supposed to get the, the 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 manual, and then you go through the check marks of the manual step by step for the safety, you know, um, of, of the plant. The reality is you're not always going to have time to get to get that safety manual. If a real accident is yeah. going to happen, yes, you want to get that safety manual, but you want to take the initial precautions for the most dangerous things. For example, there was a time. Well, we had a lube oil rupture on the first uh, number one SSTG was a sip service turbo generator. Lube oil rupture. Oh, okay. So what happened was this: um, there was a the, on the turbine. There's a duplex strainer, which means it has two bins of uh, strainers, filters, and oil goes through one, right? And then when you have to clean that one, you would shift you it over it. to the other one, so yeah. the, the flow would go through the other one, and then you could pull this one out and clean it, and it had a little little That's thing on the. Up. Yeah, so you'd, you'd unscrew it from the top, and then you open the lid, you pull out the, the, the filter, you would go clean off the filter, you put it back in, you tighten it back down, and you would shift it back and forth. So yes. this is so what happened was um, one of the guys didn't properly uh, shift things properly, didn't properly have it screwed down. So when he, he put the thing to full pressure, the whole thing blew out. And so he had lube rupture. So lube oil was going all over lagging. Now, anybody who ever knows about the forest stall, that's how the, a fort fire broke out. Of the U.S.'s forest stall because the lagging got soaked with this lube oil, causing it to get really hot, causing smoke, causing fire, and, and so that's one of the worst possible things that an injury you can have. You don't have time to sit there and go, "Okay, what do I? Let me get the let me get the manual out." No, the first thing is to control the lube oil, right? Make sure that there's no more flow being spoiled. Yeah, because it's like out. a chemical spill, you're, so you're responding to a chemical right. spill. So we'd run these drills all the time for all these different types of things. This was a real life actual scenario that did happen. Uh, the mm -hmm. guy got the, the guy got the name Loki, L O K I, Lube Oil King. <laughs> After that, that was a nickname from then on. That was Loki. Um, Funny. <laughs> so not, not kidding. <laughs> yeah. By the way, just to say, did 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 the link I put in regarding helping people with Tonga? Did that actually get there, or am I being blocked because I'm not a uh, not authorized? Did you guys see a link from Landon? Because I saw him say something earlier on the chat. Please help the people of Tonga. Landon is not a mod, so oh. <laughs> links in the live chat. Oh, well, he is a mod now. Now you can put link in. Now, now you. Oh, oh thank right, you. Yeah, yeah, you have to have mod to be able to put link in. So I give you mods tonight, put link in. Um, I was so sincerely li listening. So, to yes, we, we always do. We always did a lot of emergency protocols. Um, you know, a lot. Some of the bigger reactor accidents would be like a partial loss of coolant. We have. Um, 
diminished flow going to the reactor cores. You have an exposure of the clay. We didn't get into the technical specificities of the reactor core as far as like the, the fuel setup. So the fuel setup is set up in what's called fuel plates. These are fuel plates that have zerk, zerk oxide plating. And then in the middle of it, you have this meat. And this meat is consisting of uranium 35 um, and other elements that have an even distribution of the flux density and even burning of the fuel. And so uh, we, when you have that, you, that zerk oxide plating, plating Cladding that is going to be exposed Cladding. to air, you have yeah. oxidation, you have lower heat transfer, so you don't want to have that partial loss of cool accident. Um, so we would do drills for that constantly, and that and one thing to that is to provide water to the reactor. Now, in fact, mm -hmm. what's the last thing that I said um, when I when I on the show was makeup feed flow. Somebody asked about makeup feed flow. That's a very similar, but the makeup feed flow is not water to the reactor. Makeup feed flow is water to the condenser. Of the turbine, you want yeah. you want you want to keep the hot well. You want to have water in the hot well because when that steam goes to the want turbine, to overheat. Yeah, so you got you got to have water in that thing. So you want the steam to condense. It forms a pool of water in the hot well. You want to have that at a certain level, and yeah. that controls pressure back to the steam generator. So you ha yeah. have to have you have to have water in that secondary loop. So the makeup feed flow is what puts water back in that secondary system, mm -hmm. uh, and and so. <clears throat> That's kind of like what you'd have to make a feed flow. And you don't have it for the secondary system. You have the primary cooling pumps pumping water in that system to keep it on one and pressure and key two, keep it being um, exposed to steam, steam bubbles, or even worse, air or salt water. Yeah. But yes, to answer your question, yes, we ran drills all the time. So, 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 so again, we had, we had uh, simulation, computer simulations where. They would build a they would build a reactor you know and, and then model it because these reactors have been modeled you know very very well and so you had simulations where you had an actual in other words, we had an actual physical control panel um controlling yeah. a computer that was giving you what happened and then had run have scenarios where where and that's the nice thing about about, about about the simulations is that they can put you into a very dangerous situation they can put you into unexpected situations they can take an instrument and make it lie, um, give you false data, right? And and, uh, and, yeah. and 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 you have to respond. Yeah. Um, in a way, I don't know if you <laughs> had those sort of things where they would. Well, we did give have you stuff that no, didn't we, make sense because it didn't. I, make back back in my day, we didn't have that kind of technology. Um, what they would do to simulate, right? Okay, so so let me give you an example, Adam. And I'm, I'm, I don't know if Dapper ever had this happen. Uh, Dapper, were you were you surface or sub? Surface. Dapper. Okay. All right. So, Hi, so when you would do a watch station, you would, you would, you would, you would go down once you go around the plant once an hour, and you take measurements. You have a log. Yep. And so the log would say, okay, this this temperature was this. This was, you know, this setting. And the reason why you do that is you want to see a trend, right? Mm -hmm. And if anything goes out of out of whack, you have a normal range. Let's say this like this. If you have a spike. This, yeah. Let's say the temperature of this bearing on the surface surface server generator is supposed to be, you know, like 50 degrees Celsius or something like that, which is about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's say it's supposed to operate at that parameter, but all of a sudden you start noticing it's 51 Celsius, 52 Celsius, and it gets out of range. You circle it with red, and you have to say, okay, what is going on here? Do you have a hot bearing condition? Is the bearing having too much load? Is it wearing out? Uh, because on a turbine, when you have bad bearings, this is a bad thing. So yeah, what they right. would do to simulate this is that when you would go take <laughs> logs, the engine supervisor, like myself or somebody else, the watch supervisor, would put like a piece of red tape over or something, right? To simulate you have a hot bearing condition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. But for a drill? For a drill, right. Yeah. And so so th they would simulate these types of things by, by non – you see, like I said, we didn't have like this big – Computer generated stuff. We had old fashioned. Hey, you got a piece of red tape on it or something, or you're hot bearing condition. What do you do? And of course, the the, the first thing you do in a hot bearing condition for a super terrace generator is shut down the damn turbine, um, which is actually pretty easy. <laughs> I can be honest with you. Shutting down the ship service turbo generator on our ship, dude. All it took there was a little latch, and all you do was you flip the little <laughs> latch, and it dumped the oil pressure, and that controlled the speed regulator. That caused the, the 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 steam valve to shut. That's that was it. That's how you shut it down. And of course, then you afterwards you go down and you have to actually you know, you know manually turn the, uh, the the valves and stuff like that. But as far as actually shutting it down to do it, you just flip this whole thing. You just flipped it. Boom, boom it shut down. Um, but that was your, your number one. You had to do. You got a hot bearing condition. You shut it down, and then the next thing you do is obviously you you're supposed to get the manual first. By the way, again, 
uh, I don't know how it worked on your ship, da uh, Dapper. Did you have to get the um, manual first? I mean, this so is what if, they wanted to see, but in reality, if it was a so if there was an emergency, there were two sets of or even drills. There were two sets of actions. There were some actions that we were expected to have memorized as immediate actions, like shutting down, and the then door. right, and then there were other actions that you were supposed to grab the book because ideally the idea was once the immediate actions are completed, you're no longer in a time sensitive circumstance. So now yeah. you can go ahead, grab the book and take a look. Yeah. And your first step when grabbing the book is to verify that the correct immediate actions were taken. Correct. Yeah. And, and then, and the very next thing, obviously Manya was inform the person in the watch, the, the per officer of the watch was somebody who was sitting in a control room. And so you have these, so you have these sound powered phones and you had to contact and said, you know, um, uh, interim supervisor control or control interim supervisor hot bearing number one circuit service generators shut down scrammed reactor blah 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 and then th they go through the procedures because when you when you actually when you shut down the, the number one ship service server generator that actually was connected to the electrical power grid that controlled the CDRMs the control rod drive mechanisms so when you shut down the ship service generator generator the CDRM is open because, again, they were, if you remember watching the show, they were controlled by electromagnetic radiation where they had these things clamped down like this. Electromagnetic. screw. So they opened up, the screw dropped, and the control rods fell. So this actually scrammed the reactor when you did that. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that would happen in a power yeah. plant going on. So so we had we had a, thing, a couple of things. We, we had, you know, um, um, supercomputers at the time um, behind it doing the simulations. Um, to develop essentially these sort of uh, reactor test sort of things, which is now I understand um, in in the Navy they have you know fairly sophisticated computerized uh, demos and other things that 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 the demonstrations to to put people through as well as 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 scenarios going going forward. But it was interesting to sort of see um, on that on that set you could you know you could you know, accelerate time you could you know, make a decision. And then basically would, would show you the consequences of your decision, right? Yeah. Um, and 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 they would have things where you would you would do something which said this is not allowed, and here are the consequences, right? You can see of what happened. So, so yes, there was there's a lot of of assistance going in, into play. Now I have to say, you know, on 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 different type of nuclear stuff, you talk about of nuclear devices. There's a whole, you know, realize there's a whole safety mechanisms around nuclear devices. Um, um, you know, a safe nuclear device doesn't go off when you don't want it to. And, and so, right. um, so there's a whole bunch of procedures around that, the procedures around deciding, you know, uh, when the appropriate launch codes and how that stuff happens, uh, is also it quite, quite well simulated. So, so nowadays there's a lot of, of work that's done, a lot of training is done, um, in, in, in these simulation sets, and I think the simulation they worked really hard at making sure the simulations, um, um, you know, had a head head model. Right? They weren't just simply having a program like a video game. Um, they actually had physics behind the situation, calc doing the calcul calculations <laughs> to essentially. Well, I remember Atar Atari had a game called Scram at one time, <laughs> yeah, but it was never. It was, you know, I played it after I actually been in nuke school. I'm like, okay, this is nothing really like anything. <laughs> It had a reactor, you had a control, you had a like a pump, but I was like, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Maybe have you ever tried playing that game Scram by Atari Dapper? It no, yeah. no, I haven't. I to be fair, I never owned an Atari, so kids. Yeah, I, I owned a Super Nintendo. <laughs> Millennials. <laughs> so yeah, that's why it's it's kind of sounds like that you can do. Uh, I don't want to say it sounds like, but um. So the familiarity with the with the equipment and the physics behind it, you know, how one one thing can lead to another, that's just done like um, by by read through or something like that. Sounds like that. Um, were there any you know um, protocols that were that were followed, like where you go around doing your checks and balances every day? I'm sure there are, would be because it's a nuclear power plant. So yeah, but it's like, were, were their corners cut or were there people who would stand up to the superiors if corners were cut? I'm just asking. Well, the biggest corner cutting, by the way, thank you, Keto. Keto went shopping, got us getting us some, some nice. food. Um, I, 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 we, had, we had a roommate day, and so we went with the Applebee's and um, we had a nice little roommate days because, uh, uh, well, here's the, okay. So here's the reality, Manya. 
Uh, there are certain times. Thanks. <laughs> there are certain times when certain watch stations where certain temperatures and pressures did not change for months on end, and they were in obscure, very out of the way places that certain people may or may not would radio um, their logs, which means that basically it says this without having physically go check that. Um, yeah. Everybody's ever seen a watch station at some point ha- just did it. It just it, first of all, you you know you have there's time constraints. There's a whole bunch of other factors going into it. So anybody who says they never radio log, they're probably lying. Um, now most of them are obviously pretty significant things. They weren't of any consequence, right? Um, but that's that's where probably people probably sloughed off the most was. I, I know people that are so lazy they they radio their entire freaking log. Now I've never done that. Now, and I understand why sometimes they had to do it because, again, because time constraints, because you have to have a log. But radio an entire set of logs, nah. um, that's a bit much. Uh, again, I yeah. can understand certain ones that are way, like there might be a, like a small valve in a low pressure system that means absolutely nothing to the dirty drain system. Like who gives a shit? And I understand that. Um, and some of the things are just, they're completely irrelevant in this log. I, nobody even knew why they were even in there. So yeah, certain things did get like for example, if I look at a if I want to look at a like a, a tube and how much water's in there for you know something insignificant, do I really care if it's two millimeters in there or two and a half millimeters? I really it just who cares. Um but yeah, I say I, a lot of people would blow off their radio logs. What about you, Dapper? Um <clears throat> so there were only one group of logs that I ever really blew off. Um, and it was at one point there was a roving electrician watch in um not in the reactor room like in the and anyway so at one point they just decided hey there were these logs that a bunch of mechanics uh, mechanics were taking for like random valves you've never heard of up on you know like the the fifth deck Mm -hmm. you should take those logs now and i was like no like well they're on your log list i'm like all right well i'm gonna blaze every little every single one i'm just gonna write down a number like well you're not supposed to do that i'm like all right (laughs) <laughs> I'm not supposed to take these anyway. Right. Just like every time you tell me to go molly coat one of these small valves and I don't even know where it is or how to molly coat a valve, I'm just going to not do it. And I'm going to sign and say yeah, that I did. It's kind of like they are they are just chucking you into a scenario without giving you any yeah. training or without yeah. helping you that's, getting familiarized with the that's, And they just surprising. like take it and go. And you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> Yeah. It's human so, nature to to make things easier for yourself as much as possible. So if no one's going to help you getting familiar with the equipment, you won't check it. You won't you won't go for it. Yeah. And I've seen it so many times that has happened when you sit down and, and I'm not you the one who has to fix it. People, <laughs> so. Yeah. When you yeah. sit down and interview people and you're like, why it this is on your check sheet, why aren't you <laughs> checking it? And they're like, I don't know what that thing is. And you're like, ah. Yeah. And then and then you do this and and I've seen when when we used to do investigations um it's very easy to blame the person they're like oh why didn't you ask someone right but it's like there's this is where the organizational factors come in how much did you help this person to get familiar with the equipment you can't blame them for just backing off um so yeah it's Manya, very easy uh, to- Manya, there, was, there, there was there was literally one <clears throat> one catch-all way in the Navy to fix things. There was one thing they could do always to fix things, and it worked every single time, at least the jail thought so. Switch it off and switch it on. Uh, it on. <laughs> well, no, but well, well, hit it really hard. Pay, 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 you, 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 you bang it you bang it, or you paint it. Those are your options. You bang we, it or paint it. We sometimes, yeah. called, we, we sometimes performed what we call percussive maintenance. <laughs> it's just a really fancy term for hitting it really hard with like a mallet or a wrench wow. or something. That's not even a joke. That no. that's serious. It's called mechanical agitation, and it literally does work wow. on certain systems. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, there's there's limitations on it, but so, but you know my my experience um, when when I was on a on a you know was on a on a on a sub um, was that um, the people in the sub were were highly trained and knew. In fact, one of the things that, that the captain did, it kind of made a little bit of, of a thing, was that that when to demonstrate this to me. And so he basically get an order saying, Landon gets to ask you, as long as not a, not, not an emergency, um, any question on, on anything he sees. And as long as there's not a, um, a need-to-know reason not to disclose, um, you got to answer it, right? 
and and I tell you that 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 uh, you go through that that sub and ask anyone what's this or what's that or what are you doing that they could always tell you right away. They wouldn't even look up in the book. Right? They, yeah, because you have because okay, in order to get qualified, right? We're not even talking about we're not talking about ESWAS or dolphins. Um, mm -hmm. On a submarine, dolphins means after about one year, you you you're familiar with the entire freaking vessel. Surface warfare has what's called ESWAS, ESWAS, listed surface warfare specialist, which basically means you know everything about your ship. At least that what you need to know. Well, yeah, it's it's a little bit more limited in part because yeah. on an aircraft carrier, there's there's too much. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I get that. I look, it's, it's, it's literally the size of a city. Like but, you, you cannot it, know all of it. But it's generally that you have a general understanding of the yeah. surface capability of the warfare capabilities. And so mm -hmm. um when you're first qualifying on your ship, you have these big thick books called qual books, and you have to literally go to a person who is a qualified signer. And you say, hey, look, I have memorized, I have memorized the entire secondary plant system as far as this, this, or the, I have memorized the entire feed system. I memorized the entire primary system. I memorized the entire electrical distribution grid. And then from memory, you have to draw it. You have to draw the set points. You have to draw the valves. You have to, you have to know where all this stuff is by memory. And then if they deem that you understand and you know where it is and they ask a question, what happens to this? What happens to that? What if I flip this circuit breaker? What, what turns off? Then they sign your qualification. And in order to get qualified, I don't mean how many thousands of qualification, how many signs, signatures you oh, have to get? I never counted, but I mean, yeah, thousands. It's thousands. Is the right it's thousands. Now, and, and by the way, once you become a qualified signer, it's, it's, it's a benefit and a curse at the same time. Because one, it is demonstrated that you know enough and proficient enough to actually sign somebody that's going to be operating a nuclear power plant. But at the same are time, you, you're like, bugged like, constantly. Are you a competent assessor? Yes. Or are you competent enough to assess someone no. else? And I was, I was nice enough not to do it, to it many times. I can tell if someone is busy, I wouldn't ask. You know. Generally speaking, any <laughs> E5 or above should be able to be a full. I mean, generally, there, any, any E5 is, a, is you basically become a qualified signer. I mean, you, if you're generally. working in the, yeah, I mean, it's. It's hard not to be a qualified the, signer. The but... exception is if you're brand new to the to your current ship and you haven't qualified anything yet. Right. Because they do right make on. you requalify whenever you get to a new ship. Yeah, there's an expectation mm -hmm. there. And when we say there's a shit ton to know, we're not even remotely exaggerating. Yeah, I was I was amazed uh, you know, at the amount of stuff that they could say about blah 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 stuff. I was particularly because I was particularly quite quite fascinated by the way the control rods were were controlled and all the mechanisms to monitor the mechanisms to monitor the control rod. Did, so did you get to sit in the chair and do the shims? Did you get to shim the rods? I'm I'm yeah under under, under the thing I got I got to, to do that that set under someone else's guidance, right? Yeah. Yes. Well because when they shim the rods, right? And so you have the switch and the switch moves this way or that way and you can move the yep. you can basically control hide ride hide up or down. And you literally have to count one, two, back. It is to the it is to the second. Because yep. again you're causing reactivity to be added to the core, and you have to know exactly how many seconds you want to shim those rods. Now, again, we I only had to do it in, in, in qualification because and, and, and it, it, they, they, they went very slowly. I mean, that that that, that thing. Yeah, is, you're like, not talking about somebody yanking. Yeah, it's, it's just very it's slow. a micro thing going, spinning around, doing the stuff. So as, as it spins, it pulls that 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 screw up, and that causes the control rod to go up or down. Yeah. And then you see you watch the transient because these are all transient conditions when you're raising rod height. You have water going into the bottom of the core, which is your T cold. You have water coming out of the top, which is your T hot. Then you say the average of that. So it's T hot plus T cold divided by two. Yeah. And so when you raise rod height, it causes the water at the bottom to, to come in. You have more exposure of fuel. It gets hotter, right? It goes up. It, for, it goes to the, the turbines. Now, the turbines are drawing a lot of steam energy out of it. So it gets really cold. Much, much colder than normal because it's drawing all this energy out of the steam going to that high and low pressure system. Now it goes on the condensate to the well. Now you have denser, colder water going back into the reactor. So what the average effect is it has a higher differential in the alpha, T alpha or the T average between T hot and T cold in your, in your loop. That's what the control rod really does. As far as reactor power, no effect. What happens to reactor power is if I open the steam throttles, right, and I'm drawing steam away from that T hot, now I'm drawing more energy out of the out of the steam. Well, there's going to be a, a power increased transient, Steve. There's, let's go. Okay. Well, obviously, okay. Yes, Mister Nuke. When, when, obviously, when you share this, <laughs> there's going to be a small power transient, but that transient goes back to steady state conditions. Right. I'm just saying. Higher, I want that transient. It's, yes, it's real. Yes. yes but the power, but the power, but the power goes back to where it was initially right. after a shim. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm admitting, you know, that, 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 that when, when this operation occurred, right, there, there are people that are monitoring the, the, the direct measurement, there are people monitoring the indirect measurement, and there are systems monitoring the systems that are monitoring the systems, right? And everyone's <laughs> watching that yeah. and reporting, and everything's got to be by the book. And if anything goes slightly cattywampus, then, yeah, if you, if then you, the if, procedures come up. If you're watching, like, for example, if you do that, if you do a, a, a shim and you're looking mm -hmm. at your reactor power, you want it, you expect it to go, as you said, a little bit high, right? But as that colder water starts coming back into the core, it starts bowing itself out. It starts going back to a steady state condition. So the reactor power is going to go back to where it was, but you're going to have a higher differential between your T-hot and your cold loops. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you expect to see. So anytime mm -hmm. you have these types of, like, even like, for example, Dapper, did you actually, I never had to do a startup. As a as a as a reactor operator, do you have have you actually do a reactor startup? I've seen uh, no, it. I've I, watched it. I was not to allowed to qualify right. to do that. Me, me either. That's a very specific watch station, by the way. So, right. um, so it, it sounds like that what you're talking about, Steve. It's like that depend on a lot of on human intervention, and it's like how much of it is automated and how much it is like a lot of it is like human control. I think a lot of it is human control. I mean, yeah, I, 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 saw, I saw there a lot of control systems that yeah. if the humans were doing the wrong thing, <laughs> something would intervene. But, yeah, but it was but mostly the a problem is you can't tech. count on automated things. This is right. not a Tesla where you naively hope that the auto guidance system is going to take you. You got to know what your indicators bus. are telling you. You got to know what your you have warning lights and then you have alarms. Hmm. Warning lights telling you, hey, something is not quite right nothing to be critical about no pun intended i was like, like just get out of here fuck off but you're like okay and, and, and by the way sometimes you just have warning lights that just are going to happen it's just like, whatever it's, and there, there are no big deal yeah the but you got it i guess um of you just got you got to know that you got you got to know the system and so just, just like when you're landing a plane at mm. some point you're going to get the low altitude indicator Right, a low, yeah, that, but that might be good if you're if you're because low, if you're low, landing, you better. <laughs> if, if you're coming in and you're and you're below minimums, right? Which are, yeah. you're if you, you by the way, you pilot. I've 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 okay. I've I've sold it. So yes. let's, say, let's say let's say that you're you're you know you're coming in on ILL and you mm -hmm. have um you, you as soon as you reach the the th near the threshold runway and you're at minimums, you need to make sure that you have visual clearance for that runway, right? And yeah. it's telling you minimums. It'll it'll visually I mean it audibly hear this. This is a warning to you. That if you have not have visual um, contact with the runway at that altitude, if there's fog on the ground, you need to go around. And by the way, yes. I love, I, I, I'm not qualified to fly, but I do my flight simulators, um, and I'm fascinated yeah. by flight simulators. So I do understand the theories. I watch, I listen, I watch a lot of uh, YouTube videos on, on air, air, um, airplanes and shit. But that, yeah, that's a warning, right? It's not saying, hey, look, you need to take action. But you need to be aware of your situation that you need to have visual it's contact. Giving you the tolerance is like it's like okay, listen. Yeah, terrain. Yeah, terrain. Yeah, <laughs> yeah terrain. it's like this is yeah, yeah. terrain. Tolerance. Sink rate. This is what the tolerance is. Now you make the decision what you what you want to do with it. Or that's yeah. something like that, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah. So, so I'm gonna be talking. Do we talking a little bit later on about about the the hunger tongue eruption? Yeah. But I'm gonna I'm gonna mention oh, again no. the Question. the charity for the folks in in, in Tonga. Um, there are some people that are in really bad situations right now. Um, they are desperate. It's in life or death situations. And, and there are some couple of very good charities there that are known, that know the people of Tonga, have connections there, and have the channel to get there. Um, they're making use of New Zealand, who's done an amazing amount of, of work in there. Um, uh, the equivalent of the special New Zealand Special Forces have gone through and put themselves in great risk to go in and help the people of Tonga um, and be committed for that. So if you could click on one of those charity things and, and donate something, even if you say only got a couple bucks, some, you know, th these are people that are desperate as in that they're, 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 they're starving, they're poisoned. You have people have ruptured eardrums. You have a lot of a really bad situation and any little bit you can do to help uh, is there because one thing that I must say about about you know Polynesia and traveled and had the the fortune to travel in there is that the that the, the Polynesians by and large have a really special uh, place for visitors and how visitors are treated. Right, you show up in their island, you show up in their atoll there, and they may not have much, but they will share with you um, the food. Right, it is it is, and, and when 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 you when you especially when they they give you water. Or give you your know, coconut to, to, to drink, um, which is live fresh coconuts, amazing stuff. But but particularly if they give you food, you are now then under their protection, right? 
and 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 so and so you'll find people of Polynesia are very 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 generous, right? Um, right now, those people in Tonga area are under real dire um, situations there, and and a little bit of 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 of, of help is going to go a long way to actually saving people's lives. It's it's a it's a very very narrow like window we have. For forty eight hours, that there was no visual information coming from Tonga about how much was the damage, you know, due to the volcanic eruption. Yeah. It was yeah, I think it was only the last twenty four hours that the visuals have started coming back because, um, I think the New Zealand sent out um surveillance aircrafts there to um take pictures and stuff. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Let me ask you, Landon, a couple questions on that uh, event. Um, one, there was no warning signs prior. There were, but but again, the 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 Hunga Tonga volcano is not as not well monitored as as it as, as it should be, and and we also knew it was erupting. It was going through several phases. Eruptions aren't just one big thing, right? It doesn't go blow. Um, we knew it was uh, things were coming. We didn't know there's going to be this big, um, in part because we don't really we don't didn't really understand the geometries in, involved in it. We now sort of back. Uh, are beginning to learn what happened um but it was a it was an active volcano it's had some eruptive things prior to that um what was not understood was the ability for it to generate a, a, an event, event okay. like this and, and 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 you had dozens of calculations and how much energy you think is actually released by that so, one event so so right oh, for example we know that the air blast um just the air blast alone the fair force of the air blast right now um, the current calculations are equivalent to an 18 megaton um, nuclear warhead. That's just the air blast. That's significant. 18, what? 18 now this was an under undersea, and uh, this is an underwater explosion that went up through the water and and hit the atmosphere, and that's around 18 megatons. Um, so that's like, um, sorry, correct me if I'm wrong. 10 raised to the power. Um, well, Hirosh nine. Hiroshima was 20 kiloton. Yes. So this is about a thousand times. Holy and it and now, it couldn't really cross the globe, wasn't it? it yeah, was in fact, so in fact, in fact, one thing I'll, I'll show you there. You know, I, I operate a precision uh, radio monitoring station um, here, and and we saw the shock wave, the first shock wave move through. So we were we were we were some you know nine thousand kilometers, I think, from from the event. We saw the first shock wave pass through, and then we saw the second shock wave that gone back the other way around in the world, come back around and come the other direction. Um, some, you know, some um, nine and a half hours later, right? So we actually saw both paths where, where, the, where the sound wave went around. And I'll show you some some pictures showing that the sound wave how it went around there. But but literally, it was it was a blast heard around the world. Um, the current thing, if you, if you know about in terms of sound levels, um, the estimation of sound levels. We we're talking about. There's been many blasts. There was just one really big one. Um, and one big one, the the current estimate right now is around. Um, 312 decibels. It was loud enough that people in the Yukon and, and upper Alaska heard it. Yikes. Um, we heard it. I thought it was duck hunters, right? Although it was kind of, a, I, it, thinking back, it was a little bit more longer thing than just the pop-up ops of, of, of guns. But um, it was, it certainly was the loudest, um, you know, uh, explosion has in, been in, at least a, at least a century, and it and it, and it was it was heard um, at distances twice as far as, as Krakatoa. That being said, the, 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 there was a significant energy pulse that went into the the, the water, and there's energy pulse that went into the ground as well. Um, so the full extent of, of the eruption so forth is still being being calculated, but it's a fairly significant um, event. Just the air blast alone. Uh, it is interesting to see that that the air blast, of course. Um, gave us also an average temperature so you could actually calculate given the shock wave the because because sound going through atmosphere depends upon temperature and so we actually were able to calculate the average temperature on the globe um given the the, the, the sound wave um also for those that that have really odd notions of um geography um the sound waves perfectly match spherical <laughs> earth or a steroid Earth, I should say. You no. don't say. No, you're shilling for the NASA, aren't you? <laughs> yes, NASA, NASA shill confirmed. <laughs> but Steve, but I, it I is... got asked today, why are there still monkeys? So, I mean, who, who it's, it's a weird day. Who would have thought that the, that the acoustic conditions for 
uh, what we'd expect for seismographs, seismographs around the world and, and measurement that would would re re reveal that the Earth is not flat. <laughs> yes, shocking. Is, I mean, just it it is, to me. it's it, you know it's the way it's the way the way sound works. Um, but that being said, it, it it is a it is a case where where you know we knew it was an active you know volcano and it had been erupting and had several erupted periods. In fact, it had a had a significant building of and I'll, I'll show you when when do the screen sharing stuff that it, it built sort of a, a a cone in between two islands because the volcano had been subsurface for a while and it would create a little <coughs> island of but you know a bunch of embers and the ocean would be eroded away right. So it was it was a slightly subsurface thing, and it takes a little while for you know for a volcano to pop up of the ground. It's got to do it fast enough because if it just kind of does it gradually, then the ocean will basically roll it away, and you'll get this sort of flat top, um, which is very typical. You'll see you'll see the picture of the of the volcano um, there. You get this flat top. It's only when you get a, enough of a surge going forward that that it'll actually get above the water for a while, and so it had an island. Was a chunk that 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 was for a while, but this eruption basically destroyed that island. Um, so island island is gone. Yeah, I, I'm just looking at some of the pictures that came up afterwards. It's like um, everything's black now. Um, it's on the island of um, Namuka in Tonga, I think so. Yeah. And um, majority of it has now gone under the sea. If I'm not wrong. Yeah, and, and it is it is a case where where you know again, um, uh, if we should, so let's let's go and look at some. Of, I'm gonna I'm going to pull in some of the things. I had sent initially this stuff to Chesh, but I'm going to pull it in here. Um, where is so Chesh? so? Um, let me do some screen sharing. Stuff getting here. beer. I don't actually know that. That's I just made that up. I, I assume I assume I hope she's getting beer. Um, I, I'm, I'm told that, that goblins need beer, so... Heck, you know what? I'm going to get something to drink. That, that's their blood. They don't have blood. They have beer. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, it just get kind, of, kind of surprises me sometimes, like, how ill-equipped some nations are. Or even, like, if you go to the United Nations, like, how ill-equipped they are for natural disasters like these, like these ones. I guess it depends from country to country because Tonga is a very small country. Like it doesn't have so many resources to monitor that volcano. I guess. So, yes, and 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 it is a case where where there's a lot of um, there there's a lot of of a lot of volcanoes that are in very dangerous situations that are very poorly monitored. Um, you know, there's 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 sort of like the, the it's called the deadly ten, um, and White Island. And New Zealand is one of those that that that, that they know that was that had a really no um, uh, of that. And um and by the way, for for those that are that are in North America, um, Mount Rainier is also one of the the ten deadliest volcanoes. A very very dangerous volcano. Yeah. In a in a thing that dangerous is That's in part that. because of of its ability to to be destructive and its and its proximity to things to destroy. Well, Rainier is actually one of the ones that they think. I mean, if if one is going to go up, it, that is a higher probability than most. Yeah. Um, so 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 um, so right now, by the way, right now, what it wants me to do is get to. Um, it wants me to do a a give um, redo the the screen control. This is going to cause me to exit, but it'll come back and and right. stream yards. On there for, for chrome so so I'll, I'll be right back yeah we had an earthquake here the other day it actually made the whole house jump for about a split, a split second the matter of fact it was like it just jumped and i was like was that earthquake and then we'll check the computer and about two seconds later yeah 4.3 magnitude about five miles away but i mean i we, i mean I, I can literally walk down the street and i'll be standing on top of the san andreas fault from where i'm at it's not that far i mean it's about a mile or two from here. um i i remember when um I was living in another location. It's kind of an epicenter for um, a lot of earthquakes. And it was for the first time I experienced an earthquake while being near the epicenter of it. So it's very different. I think I've, re I've repeated this before. It's very different when you're near the epicenter when or and when you're away from it, quite away from it. And um, for me, it came like just this one, like some someone had like this, 
crashed their car into the side of my house. That's how, big, what how, how big how big was it? Huh? What um, is the magnitude? Um, I don't remember the magnitude, but um, but yeah, it I was mean, quite significant. I mean, a four a four is not much, but it's definitely notable. A five is a lot more notable. And, and I mean, these are these are logarithmic scales. So I mean, you're talking about yeah. orders an order of magnitude, ten times more fold of energy being released. Yeah, yeah. and thirty so, times thirty times of, of, I, I of motion. Also, yeah. yeah, and it also depends on the on the plate structure of that area, also, like how the shock waves will affect that area. So, um, what kind of soil you have in that area? And it's compactified. Yeah. Yeah, it depends a lot on that also. Ooh, goody. Oh, so, we... so go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, did did you guys see the um, the footage from the Himawari Eight satellite? Of that Japan uses? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is that is that oh, the yeah. one that, that showed it expanding? So, was that the Himawari? Yeah, there was. You so could that's... see the shock wave and the gas yeah. and okay. the, well, the so, dust cloud. So I'll oh, show yeah. you some of that stuff there. So so here's. Here's essentially back back to saying, well, why does why do these volcanoes occur? Um, and right now, what they were in, in they're, they're in an area where the Pacific Plate is basically going underneath the plate, which is which has, you know, model places like New Zealand and that Australia, Australiana Plate, um, and and you see here that the the uh, you know basically the one plate gets pushed, the Pacific Plate is being pushed underneath this other um, the other plate that that you find. In Australia, on, and and one of the things that happens besides besides considerable amount of friction, um, and, and earthquakes occur when these things kind of smash into each other. There's melting, and the melting basically causes material to come up, and and away from the actual fault trench plate, you'll get these volcanic eruptions. That's where the melting um, is up here. And so Hunga Tong is one of those volcanoes that comes up um, alongside, but but offset from the actual fault fault zone. Um, and and in in this this this, if we look at the actual Hung Tong of uh, the volcano, um, the volcano actually rises almost two kilometers from the ocean base. So it's a pretty tall mount, pretty tall mountain. Um, and the size here, we look here's five kilometers um, in depth, and you see the depth in, in meters from from the. But only the little top of it is actually visible. There, there's there's actually you see this 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 ring here is the actual ring of the caldera of, of the volcano. So when you see pictures of the island, the island was just a little tip of one of the edges of one of the rings. And, and um, in this ring, you see there's these little bumps here. There's other, there's other um, you know, volcanic vents at the summit of, of, the, of the volcano. Kind of like that and, just ready to go kind of thing, isn't it? Those little bumps. And, and, and so, yes. And so this is, this, this is, this is the, the deep part. Purple is the deeper part up to... A black which is near near the surface and then this this is the actual island itself and so this you know 1917 19, yeah excuse me eight um 2019 2018 2017 is when this part of the island is kind of built it had been there up and down up and down where it get up a little bit above the ocean and the ocean waves would really wash it away um this one this particular part of the island um lasted for for a while until the actual eruption occurs now underneath this this um, underneath this uh, volcano is a series of chambers, right? That that if you go back to the if you go back to the to the previous um, the previous image, right? That these um, volcanoes tend to have these little little um, um, chambers, magma chambers, um, often ones kind of underneath the, the base of it, and then ones that are deeper down. Um, it's not necessarily just just and and we've learned from Kilauea, um, the, the 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 active volcano in Hawaii. That that volcanoes simply have multiple chambers, not just one big thing in there, but there's lots of little ones. And so the current model is there was a there was a magma chamber sitting underneath this area of the of the um, of the volcano, and it had done a series of eruptions over a num uh, over a number of years to build up this island block here. And one thing to understand about uh, if you take take away one thing about volcanoes, volcanoes tend to do their most destructive um, this, the most danger, not by exploding, but by by falling and by collapse. And and nearly all of the great um, eruptions that we've uh, you can name about are cases where the volcano fell in on itself. Um, this is what happened here. This 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 part of this island disappeared um, because essentially it it fell in that the, the top of the magma chamber collapsed. 
Um, so yeah. are you saying that when that top collapsed, it kind of created this, it just covered the surface and then it, you know, the pressure started building inside it and that resulted in, a, in an well, eruption? Well, the, 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 the couple of things that happened, when, when, the, when the magma chamber collapsed, you then had a bunch of ocean water pour in onto the magma mm. chamber. And it's the combination of the two that, that hit that caused the, the, the explosion. Um, that shockwave also caused, we believe, a, a, an, av an avalanche, right? So, so this is like two kilometers down to the base. And so part of this, it's, it's very likely that part of this we'll see when we, when we get back to Scanlon, that we'll see a big slide, that the chunk of this material fell down into the ocean, right? Because tsunamis come from, from a lateral notion of a push, um, yeah. The ejection of the steam explosion going up to the atmosphere was a result of a, a shockwave between between magma and, 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 and water, mm -hmm. um, and and so that was where the, the explosion occurred. But 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 the tsunami was generated by some action. Part of this 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 side gave way. There are certainly other magma chambers besides the one underneath this that we. Um, and, and one of the one of the models that you could use that's plausible, but again, we have to confirm it by, by collecting data, which is hard right now, is that this particular cone, this, this shape, was created by material from the magma chamber coming up to the surface. And so it's quite possible that 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 eruption of this material here caused the magma chamber to become um, vacant, right? That it that it that it that there became a cavity. Um, and, and so you have, you have material coming on the top, getting more pressure and you have less magma underneath to support it. And so the roof collapsed in on the magma chamber, but the roof collapsed with, 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 with ocean water on top. And, and again, this might be, you know, a surface, but, but where it collapsed in here, it probably had, um, you know, a hundred meters, 200 meters of water on top of it. So you had water all of a sudden hitting hot magma. Um, also, that mag magma, um, the reason why magma comes to the surface, it becomes lava. Magma is underneath, lava is itself on top, is, 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 that, is, the, is that there are dissolved gases under pressure inside the rock. And the, the, those gases come out of solution, basically come from liquid to, to gas, boil, and that boil gives it that, that fizz, that, that, it, it, that loft. That's the reason why, because rock wants to sink. Right, gravity, rock wants to sink, and so and so gases coming up to the surface. When you when you when it comes up to the surface, below, closer to the surface, the pressure drops, 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 and and what was a liquid becomes gas. That gas becomes a bubble. The bubble pops and gives that, that little bit of push. So you had an eruption where where the the gases escaping were bringing being magma up to the surface, becoming lava, creating a top creating a hole in the magma chamber, the top getting heavy, collapses in on top of it. Now you have, you no longer have a lid on it. Now you have a release of pressure. So all of that, all of that, that, that gas in, that's in liquid form under pressure becomes gas and, 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 and flashes to, to gas instantaneously. Plus you have um, water hitting the, sur hitting the surface of it. And you have a steam explosion to add to it, and you get this tremendous launch of of of, of, of stuff happening. Yeah. Um, now I want to show you again the the the, the set here, um, in terms of water depths, right? Mm -hmm. So we had this this 2015 cone that build up, and again this 2009 2015 this this area of the cone had been built up for over 1,100 years. Um, and 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 so we know we suspect somewhere under here was was one of the magma chambers near the surface, and it it had been been having gases reach the surface, boil, push it the, the magma up, becoming lava, and it and it did it fast enough that the ocean couldn't roll it away and created this sort of this this island um, group here that had had this nice little cone here with 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 a with a um, um, a little little peak in there. So this is where the explosion occurred, um, quite possibly because that was the weight on top of the of the of the lid that was on the magma chamber that no longer is supported. We're, we're speculating at this point because we're basically taking other volcanic things and assuming this is this is the way it happens. Kind of a simulation. Um, but 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 we'll know more and more details. But the current model now 
is that this was a collapse on top. This, this, this cone fell in onto the magma chamber and with it, you had water depth um, out to you know, 50 to 100 meters of water. You had the same amount of water all of a sudden coming in contact with magma, which has its lid cracked open. It, it releases pressure. So all of a sudden, those gases start rushing up, hot gases rushing up, carrying, carrying magma with it, meeting ocean water coming down to the bottom. And the two hit a steam explosion, and you had a tremendous um, um, release of energy at that point. Um, it's had multiple eruptions since then, not as big as the one, the, 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 the big poles. Um, and, and we've learned from Kilauea that when a uh, magma chamber collapses, it's not just, oh, it's done and, and, and it's gone, right? Um, Mount St. Helens even you know, has, has had a dome building exercise where if you look at the center, Mount St. Helens, the, the mountain again fell in on itself. Again, volcanoes are most dangerous when they collapse in on themselves. And Mount St. Helens was a case of a collapse of a peak on itself, um, all exposing the magma chamber that was near the, 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 the base of the mountain. And it has rebuilt that, that pit by about half the, the distance now since the 1980 eruption. So if this follows along with typical volcanoes, there will be a new um, a series of explosions, um, probably less violent because there's less pressure buildup um, there, but it'll probably end up building a new cone um, somewhere in this area, and 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 that will rise up near the surface. The ocean will keep rising away, but if it does rapid enough, it'll get above the ocean, stabilize, and and a new island will will reform. Um, I'm going to show you the, the 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 picture. I think is is I mean, look at 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 this is the satellite showing you the the moment of eruption, right? And mm -hmm. so we see. The, the initial set here. So the island, um, give you a scale. The island is probably about the width of the or the arms of the crosshairs. So this big island here is probably at this scale, about about that size, somewhere in there. Wow. Um, so it's already so, under that mushroom, isn't yeah. it? So it's always already it's already pushed out and blown out the island, and we see the shock wave moving forward. Now, one reason why the shock wave is going to the side is because that's where the air is. Right. The, wow. the, 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 at this point, um, at this scale here, it has now pushed the atmosphere, most of the atmosphere up above the normal sun. So this, this bump here is actually higher than most of the atmosphere. Um, it's up in the stratosphere right now. And so it's basically had enough loft that's pushed air up above where it normally is sitting. You can also see the beginning of the shock waves right here. You see these rings here on mm -hmm. the side. You can see the, you know, the shock waves beginning to generate. And, and part of what we think as well is that there's a tsunami being generated. Um, there's an avalanche occurs because when you have that much, you have that much shock going on, um, the side of the volcano probably gave way and created an, an avalanche underneath the sea and that's generating the tsunami. Um, as, as we continue going forward, we now see that the, the, the blast is flattening out. You see more of the shock waves occurring um, on, the, on the scale. Um, and here's a case where what we now see is, is a beginning of what's called the, the mushroom cloud, the central peak. So yeah. underneath this bump here is probably where the, 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 the most of the magma heat is, is, is concentrated. Um, again, that's where the island, um, occurred. And so we see that, that is, that is actually lofting up, um, you know, out above the stratosphere. Um, whereas this shockwave is going through most of the stratosphere, that that the, the thick part of the thick part of the um, of the of the of the atmosphere is going in there. So if we go into another set here, now we can see the clearly the pulse coming in in the water, right? And so this mm -hmm. pulse is moving through the water at the speed of sound, whereas the shockwave is moving through the air at the speed of sound of the air. Um, and beginning to see some of of the of the the, the, the blast has has elevated bits of magma that have turned into the, you know turned into ash being lofted up into the set. We see it 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 continuing to expand, continuing to expand. We can see now multiple shockwaves. So one of the things this has tells you is this is not one big pop. This is pop 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 pop. Oh, it's, yeah. it's, That's right? why there's these waves, and you can see the yeah. waves. 
in the but, in the in that cloud. Because what's happening is 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 that is that the the the, the water rushes in, hits contact, turns the steam, explodes, push the water back out, the water rushes in, contact, steam, explodes, back forth, back forth, back forth, back forth, continuing to loft and tend, and and the weakest the weakest part of the, of the cap is going straight up. And so that's where it's lofting gas and, and, and ash up, whereas it's also saying shockwaves to the side of this thing going bang, 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 right? And we see it, it continue to, to, to reverberate there. So all these things are, again, um, shocks and explosions that are occurring. Here again, you see that the central mushroom that is, that is now nothing, you're actually casting a shadow in the Earth's atmosphere against the stuff. It's actually you know, lofting out into space now um, at, at this stage. Wow. Um, so, so if we look at another set here for, for stuff, um, I want to show you um, a, a thing here that, that talked about, um, uh, where is it, uh, in the in stuff with, with, the, with the lightning here. And so I'm going to go. Um, one of the things that also happens with volcanoes that we've learned is there's tremendous amounts of static electricity that gets generated. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm going to, let me get this, I'm going to bring this over to the spot here. Um, okay. What we're seeing is a movie of the explosion, but, but I'm, these dots in here are lightning strikes. Oh, wow. Now, what happens, one of the things that happens when, when you have you know, high temperature um, um, magma turning into ash and shocking is you, is you get a lot of friction. And that friction creates static electricity. And static electricity creates lightning strikes. Um, and this is probably the thing that was probably the most unusual thing about this, this um, um, uh, set. So this is, this, is a, this is, again, this is a set running at around, um, um, you know, in terms of, of talking about one minute, one minute lightning plot, right, of, of, of sets there. What we discovered and what was shocked people, because you can see the lightning from the radio pulses, is that, that this thing was generating, as this cloud was expanding, over 300,000 um, uh, lightning strikes an hour. 300,000 an hour. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's going around, it approached, it, there's a times where it approached a thousand lightning strikes in a second. Wow. Um, from all the stock shit. So that was a very unusual thing. We, you know, when, when I, when I was, was at Mount St. Helens, when it blew up in 1980, that was certainly the one of the things that what struck me the most was what was expected was lightning <laughs> lot going off the side of, of Mount St. Helens up into the ash cloud. The, the ash that, that was lofting up into the stratosphere um, was, was, was creating static, you know, charges and, and you get lightning arcs from it. Um, but this one had, had, had lightning arcs like we've never seen before. I mean, in terms of, again, it, 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 and so you're seeing over a period of minutes, these, these are, you know, lightning pulses, dot, 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 dot. And so in this particular movie, there's over a million lightning pulses that, that occur in, at this particular time. Um, and I can imagine for the people that are in some of these islands, under there, under those lightning poles, is what it would have been like to be under a case where you had, you know, in a period of a couple of minutes, like this. You see, you look at look at these dots here. Um, let me see if I can stop it again. Um, you see, there's some islands here. There's some islands here. There's a couple of islands here. A couple of islands here. A couple of islands, yeah. right? Islands yeah. nearby. So these people are underneath this stuff, where this sort of this this almost this this under we're our, our, our outer you know world type experience of these lightning strikes coming in extremely loud i mean the shockwave was 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 enough but the yeah. lightning strikes were were also just just enormous the 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 na the, the, there was a new the first people on the scene was again a a, a, a special forces from new zealand um they actually had a um um, um a special ship that i believe was a submarine that actually got there there first and they arrived in this island here um they're in this, this particular island here under the spot, so where, where my cursor is, right? So the eruptions here, this island's here, and and they they were reported that that the people that they had that they encountered, um, they had trouble communicating because their eardrums had ruptured. Ooh. 
that, that nearly everyone in the island they could tell at that point was deaf. The shockwave and so forth, the thing was loud enough that they, their, their drums burst. Um, another thing that happens, a bad thing that happens with all this amount of lightning is you get, you get a lot of, of, of water being basically split apart. So you get, you know, sort of you get, you get hydrogen gas and explosions that are occurring. But the other thing you have is in the ocean, you have fluorine and chlorine compounds. He's all okay. sodium chloride, right? But, but you've got all this lightning basically turning that into a chemical soup. And the result is you like have- Acid, is it? Acid rain, is it? How do yeah, so you have you have you have chlorine and fluorine compounds, chlorides and fluorides being generated like mm. crazy on the on the on the thousands of metric tons level, and and one of the problems that people have in Tonga is that they're they're suffering from um, fluorine and chlorine poisoning, and the even the areas where the, where the island might have been survived, the fish and the plants and so forth are now contaminated by these 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 chemicals generated by this um, this extraordinary lightning event that occurred but like they can have like respiratory issues for the rest of their lives these people yeah and 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 it's it's also like the fluorine if you get that that you know it gets into your bones um it's, oh, it's yeah. pain for the rest of your life it's misery and yeah it slowly like eats away your bones yep yep and 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 one of the problems is that 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 people who didn't get direct Poise, you know, direct, you know, survive the, the eruption, like out here farther in these women's islands, they're in a situation where their island is contaminated, their food sources or water sources are contaminated. Oof. And and they have a choice between starving, dying of thirst, or 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 being poisoned. And, or being and evacuated so, so they can go somewhere where they and can. So get these charities are both both getting people rescued as well yeah. as providing them with, with critical things about, because I mean, there's only so much time you can survive without, without water. And the water that's there is now contaminated, horribly contaminated. Um, yeah. so, so they can't, so even if they had anything in store and storage, that's like, that's, it, that's like useless yeah. now. And, and the dust, the ash dust is the volcanic ash dust. Like I spent with Mount St. Helens, is is like um the grid very of a fine. sandpaper it's yeah. very very gritty sandpaper and oh, okay. and you can try to close your door close your windows and keep it up but it but it's it's dust that pervades throughout it and and i remember you know it's nice um, to think, uh, it? It, it is it was it was it was painful to sleep because you're you're basically sitting on resting on sandpaper so imagine lining your bed with sandpaper and trying to go to sleep. See, I, I had some uh, at one time at Mount St. Helens Ash. It was in a, you know, those old pill bottles that you, they used to come mm -hmm. and have. And so uh, the stuff I had was actually very fine. And you could actually compactify it. Um, yeah. But it was it was not like sandpaper. It was actually very, very fine ash that I had. But I mean, the ash got down way where well, I was. I'm, at, was I'm talking about grit LA. sandpaper. Grit. Yeah. yeah. Right? It, it's abrasive um, as, as, as all get on. And just and, imagine inhaled it it's going to cause so much irritation in your lung tissue you can develop cancer from it if i'm not wrong yes and 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 it impacts your ability to get you know bone marrow and so forth it is it is a thing what? so so here is the best know, thing would be to evacuate all the people from that island i think yeah, so, and so they're trying but yeah. you know that's a that's um, that's that's one thing I wish I still had was that ash. Um, I've lost a lot of things in my years, but yeah. as a kid, I, I had that for a very long time because that's something I was like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep this because this is like memorable that a volcano went up. Um, yeah. I have I have my block of Mount San Salvador ash over here. Um, in my in my my cup. I've learned to keep it inside of a of a of a bag, but but uh, because if you open up and pour it out, it, it basically goes in the air and gets all over. Yeah. So. So here's a what we're looking at. We're looking at right now on the screen. Um, you know, here's Tonga. Here's Fiji in terms of of, of stuff there about about the eruption. This is a really nice thing from from Australia. And here you're know, talking about the, the explosion that occurred here. So there's there's Central Tonga and there's the explosion occurring. So again, oh, look, give me the Here's the curve oh, of the earth. Right. What? And the earth isn't curved. This is all CGI. <laughs> and Fake. so you're seeing. There, there's an explosion occurred where you can see it satellite from space. You see the size of that. Look at that CGI. It's amazing. Computer processing. Um, wow. And you see the pulse going through the, the ocean. 
one third to PG, isn't it? So, yeah. so is this is this what we would expect if it was hit by a small meteor? Right? Yeah. Something similar. Yeah, that would be, yeah, that'd be that'd be an asteroid, you know, size thing for for something in the water. I watched. I watched uh, just look up, and there you can see. There, you can, again, look at the shock wave going through. Da, 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 you can see that shock wave. Have, have you seen yeah. just Have you seen just look up yet? So you think this um, this, um ash that will travel to Fiji also land? Oh yes. So again, given for people that, that they're here's the eruption site, here's New Zealand, here's Australia. So it's basically a triangle. The distance from from like Queensland to to to, to New Zealand to there is sort of forms a triangle yeah. like that in terms of of, of location. And here again, these are all the volcanoes that are in in this area. So here's the Pacific plate, <laughs> and here's the Australia New Zealand plate here, and and you see along the the, the plate boundary here, New Zealand is one of the big islands that are on that, that crack, but there's many other volcanoes. And mm. Tonga is on this knot of, of volcanoes up here of, of this line. Again, this is the crack between where the two plates push into each other. Um, and so this was the this was that 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 top of the island. Remember now the caldera is actually no, it's there in this black. area, right? So, um, so that's 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 the that's the top of the volk over the called Honga Tonga Honga Hop. So, so yeah. Landon, we had pandemic last year, volcano this year. So next year has to be comet strike, well, and then and, the, and then and then zombie apocalypse, um, right? But 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 also, I want to say on the other hand, right now the 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 number there there are there are fifty one volcanoes on Earth right now that are erupting, and twenty five of them have lava on the surface. So yeah, but that's like a slow flow. Unusual. They're slow flow usually. They're not. They, they, yeah. they're not. So explosive. so here is the case of this this island that again the the caldera is here. You see where the caldera was, right? And and when it when it when it and if you look at where the where the thing is, this this volcano rises over two kilometers above the the ocean. We're only the the tip of this tip of this here reached the top. These things are close, but they're not there. There's a so in here, but this is shows you, you know, more than 20 kilometers across here and, and like, two kilometers high. It's like a top of a cooker, like it's closed. Yeah. And there's one little this this whistle that's blow that blew. It, what that's what it looks like. Yeah. Um, so this is this is no no, this is the pre-eruption um um you know, a math is taking, you know, you know, um, on sounding measurements. We don't, this is not what it looks like right now. Don't Obviously it, it, it has changed. Not. It's changed significantly since, since then, but you can see there is the, the spot there showing the, the, the volcano. So you can see that before, um, January 7th, January 15th, there was an eruption that kind of cut out the middle of it. And January 18th, it's most of the island is, has, has, has gone. Wow. Um, and the blast, if you look at, for example, give me a scale of, on that thing, when you talk about, when you see that, that, that mushroom cloud, that's over 500 kilometers across from here to here. Wow. Right. For, so from, from like Canberra to Melbourne in terms of scale. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's the, that's the, 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 the shockwave that, that expanded in that in the area. Now, now, if you, if you look at, um, Again, if you look at, at what, what's, what's, what's happening here, um, one of the things that we saw was, was a significant number of, of uh, you know, people heard this shockwave. People in Anchorage listened to it. They can audibly hear this thing. And there were, there were reports of people reporting an explosion in Anchorage, Alaska, over 9,300 kilometers away. I mean, they clearly, clearly heard it, clearly in audible range, in fact, in in there 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 are someone that recorded you know over over 105 decibels in Alaska. That's this, quite high. That's like above the um above the limits that humans are supposed to be exposed to. 85 decibel is the limit. Yeah. If I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um. Um. It's 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 not it's not a it's not a good thing to see. Um. No. So so one of the things I was going to show you here is also the shock wave of the air, right? So we look at this this shockwave going through. You'll see the pulse spreading across the planet. Oh, wow. this, again, it's multiple shockwaves going across. Again, this is this is this is the atmosphere um, shockwave, the atmosphere from from that eruption going around the globe. Reason why it it, it circles so effectively. Um, 
and and also of course the big thing is we had the tsunami right so this is this is the this is a tsunami that occurred and and these are the pulses that went through the water and you can see tsunami was not just a it, tsunamis are not just a uniform circular pulse there's it, it, it's energy directed in the water and and the way the blast occurred the geometry sent a lot of it towards um uh the the north america on this side here um there was some in japan and they had you know some some campsites of, of boats in japan here on the edge there also was was were pulses that pulses that went and hit south america and there's some deaths here from tsunamis um that that they went there um there was a on the north island new zealand um case of australia because the great barrier reef um a lot of that was stopped by the great barrier reef in, in this area here but but the north island new zealand had had things but but new zealand actually has a very effective tsunami warning system um the big problems they have sometimes with the tsunami warning systems people dumb people go down to the ocean to watch it um I, I think that's it. what we call the Darwin Award. <laughs> I, think, I think so. Yeah, those people can take the Darwin Award more. Um, so a colleague of mine recorded the 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 blast at he's up in, in Hawaii. Yeah. And so he actually saw so that's the that's the shockwave. Let me go back again through here. So you see you see the shockwave. Um, let's go again. That's, there's a shockwave passing across Hawaii. Um, why is the shockwave? The shockwave is a pressure, and so it's going to cause air to condense. And so that shockwave um, created it's the. Like, the that it's stuff. like when when the airplanes it, like they break the mock barrier, isn't it? And yeah. That, that, kind of like that, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So here's the thing showing you the shockwave as it as it spins around the world, right? And so um, there is also an interesting reports over here in Africa. Or off coast of Africa, where people heard essentially the, the, you know, they had a concentrated spot on this side where the shockwaves went through, and so there was a re local reports of people in this area hearing the big explosion of of the of the shockwaves going around on that side, um, and and um, of course that that th this was a case where where um, or again this 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 sound wave. Um, was was really quite a spectacular um, eruption that that occurred. I'm going to show you a graph here. Um, so this is this is this is this is the barometer that we operate at Treehouse, and and here's the first peak. So this is the normal sort of 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 uh, of back and forth of of, of a of a of weather, right? And this peak here is the first peak of the first shockwave. This peak over here is the second shockwave of coming back around the world the other side. Now remember, this barometer is, is designed to record air pressure in five minutes. This is not a fast acting acting thing, but the but it was it was a it was enough of a blast that we could we could we could we could you know we can see the first um shockwave hit the barometer and record and the shock and shockwave here from back around the other side of the world coming in and um, saying and So you can see the, the pressures that occurred at the time. The second shock wave was a little bit more spread out. Typically waves as they travel begin to have different frequencies that begin to disperse. And so it's it's uncommon to see the, 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 the peak that traveled only 9,000 kilometers um, be, be much more central, whereas the peak that, that traveled 31,000 kilometers all the way around the other side, um, is, is a bit more spread out and not it of course it's also it's not as not as fine so that's a little bit of of, of stuff there. i don't know if there's any questions about the volcanoes or other sort of stuff i mean there's, there's plenty of you know we call, we call volcano porn uh, image um stuff uh for, for I, volcano stuff but but i think for me for me it's like it's not a question but it's like how to keep the people safe in Tonga, and I think that it will be the, according to me, I don't know why, I'm I'm not an expert, but the best course of action would be to evacuate rather than bring supplies because there's this risk of those supplies that you're the help that you're getting to Tonga getting contaminated again. So I think so. The best thing would be to evacuate the Tongans 
to safer um, places and then take it from there. I think so that's, um, yeah, it's a mass exodus, I realize, and a lot of um, migration and how do we deal with that? That's also another thing. How do we make sure these people settle down? If they are going to settle down on a new place, how, how they're going to settle down, you know, all the logistics of it, that's going to be really, really um, very complex. But I think that, that's the, that should be the next course of action, according to me, someone who's worked in risk. I don't know. Yeah, uh, I mean, and, and, and certainly there are other people in other areas that, that could that could assist and take some of these people. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Australia and New Zealand can absorb the population quite easily, and Fiji. I'm not wrong. But again, it's all about um, with the COVID there and everything. This needs to be, um, yeah, pre-planned. Um, for for stuff, but but the but again, the problem that they're they're facing, and why I'm going to put the link again into the into the the the, the chat there. Um, why it's, it's 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 so critical right now is that that people um, people need right now they need basically you know they can you know water and food and and then you know um, medical assistance and and there but so no question about the volcano but last show somebody said West Coast uh, said that the West Coast it was uh, Canada so was devastated by. But I, I certainly wouldn't use the word decimated. You might be able to say it was um, measurably but imperceptibly by humans impacted. That that might be a more accurate way to say it. Okay. You would have to have actual measurement devices to really notice. Yeah, but but my question would be, I, I guess, like if you have to, like who, who will be, uh, which organized do we look up to to really really go in there and scan the volcano and come up with a new model for it who would be doing the well there certainly are there certainly are the, 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 the tonga has a has a, a geological uh survey sort of group but also uh, certainly um australia and zealand have uh, very significant um geosciences groups that are going there to to travel there to to, to see and assess the situation one of the things you want to do in volcanology is try to give uh, people in the region some idea about what's happening right um the eruption is not over there there have been other explosions not nearly the same magnitude um the question is is this something where it's kind of sputtering and dying out is it is, is there a um a, a chance for for another caldera because there's multiple calderas in that in that seamount um is there a chance for one of those other calderas to to collapse as well or is it is it somewhat stable? Um, um, what about the ash? You know, the ability to have um, more ash fallout. Certainly, we've had we've had a couple of, of tsunami warnings that have occurred, and that suggests that there's been some avalanche, continued avalanches, that the side of the mountain may still be unstable, and there's been some falls that have created some tsunami stuff action. Again, mostly to kind of the the north and and east. But uh, the the so so trying to assess the risk and tsunamis and also trying to assess the 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 set for for ash fallout. Um, with regards to the atmosphere, the the one of the things they're trying to determine is how much how much ash actually got up in the atmosphere, and how much in the way of of, of sulfur dioxide. Early ox estimates is around two hundred thousand tons of sulfur dioxide was ejected in the atmosphere. Um, the, the the guess model is that this may have a slight cooling effect for a couple of years on the southern hemisphere, and by slight cooling effect, I mean like you know maybe maybe a couple tenths of a degree, but that still is early to tell. They they'll have a much better idea um, doing the the measurements of how much how much um, uh, ash actually um, made it in the atmosphere, how much um, um, sulfur compounds and other things. Made in the atmosphere, these kind of volcanic activities, like what happened in Mount Pinatubo, I believe in 1991, if I recall correctly, um, have an ability to, to 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 depress temperatures for for a year to a couple of years before returning back to normal. Um, this is not a way to solve the problem of forcing energy in the atmosphere and the atmosphere becoming generally warmer. Um, it's, a, it's sort of a temporary reprieve, 
and it also has a lot of cost comes involved with it in terms of 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 this you know shock to the atmosphere but we right now we, we're, we're trying to assess um how much material went in the atmosphere and um whether or not it, it if if this is a fairly clean explosion um from the atmosphere standpoint as in a lot of the material got trapped in the water there may be less impact on the atmosphere than if it were um above the surface we think most of the explosion occurred underneath the, the slight underneath of the ocean and so two way thing isn't it if it's going up it's gonna go down also but it's like you're thinking yeah. it's more towards the underground than towards the um yes open space atmosphere yeah okay. so 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 you'll see actively you know there's 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 folks on site part of it they have to assess is when it's safe to actually come in and, and, and major and monitor and as well with with this kind of emergency situation the first priority is getting medical service people um yeah up out and and available right they're they're kind of the first priority but um alongside it are our volcanologist to to help assess the situation understand what are the more immediate threats to 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 the the region and and whether or not um you know there there are there are other things that they need to 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 look at with regards to um um the near term long term is this volcano will continue to be active right um we've seen uh, approximately 1100 years ago um this volcano had a uh, we believe had a major eruption like this um it, it it it's it's naive to think well then every thousand years it'll it'll end up happening all these other things um because we don't know about 1100 years ago really what happened we have legend from Polynesians. We have geologic evidence that something big happened in this area, uh, but we don't know to what extent um, it 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 you know it may have had a, a central peak that collapsed. It may have been a, a, a more minor explosion compared to this one. We don't know, so we don't know what the future is. Yeah, but yeah. kind of it brings forth the importance of um, you know um, traditional learning also. And um, even if, if and and the legends that come from you know the culture the cultural thing, mm -hmm. um, how it's very important and you can actually use that because um, there was no other way to you know assess disasters, so they developed these you know legends or some kind you know to describe like some kind of a demon you know uh, for example like in Maori culture like there's this. Um, um river that goes around the curve and uh, once in a while it would slap its tail that's what they would say every two or three years or something like that so there's a lot of value that can be taken from traditional learning and cultural learnings i think so and and the local legends i think so yeah that that is also very significant um, and, and can play a role so yeah yeah i gotta wrap it up guys uh, <laughs> yeah we can talk about it forever man <laughs> all good uh, but Landon, always a pleasure. This was fun. Thank you, again. Uh, thank you, Landon. A lot of hours sitting here, uh, thank, all the way yes. from reactors to, to volcanoes. So, Daphne, thank, thank you. you for that, Manya. Thank you very Manya. much for 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 putting all the hard effort in trying to restore non sequitur shows so that we can working on it. And and if we can get the audio working at the initial um, intro, I think <laughs> it might be there. Just yeah, like. you know, you know, that's it. That that, that that some people did something right, but no, I, I'm congratulations on having the channel back. It's wonderful to see that, that this is, is continuing. Um, and I look forward to what's, by the way, what's the next show? Uh, if I may ask. Yeah, we have Dr. Jim Majors, Dr. S.A. Thomason, and uh, a few other people talking about uh, if Christianity is better than atheism. Okay. Basically, yeah, something along those lines. Uh, we also have, uh, I got Dr. Sidney Wadi coming on to talk about metaphysics and grounding. I've got uh, a guy, I got one, one, at least one, maybe two people from Discovery Institute coming on. One of them is a, well, they're both really big names in the Discovery Institute, but I'm not going to say who yet. Um, Der, uh, Dapper knows. Um, but yeah, we've got we got some things going up. I think I said, sometime later on, I, there are many other people, worthy people to show on there. We can do something on on, 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 on radiation and the effects of radiation and some like of that. stuff of, of going going forward. Yeah, that'd be cool. Um, and we do a three level thing. I can just talk a little about the effects of, of fallout from nuclear nuclear tests, um, as well as the general biological stuff. I think I think again, one of the things is that 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 while these things are scary, if people 
have a better understanding um, when bad things occur, there's not this mass panic liquor. The world is not going to end. Sounds um, like a plan to me. And if you learn from your mistakes, you're less likely to repeat them, hopefully. Yeah, that's but what's please, important to investigate and do the root cause analysis. Yeah. Please, again, um, take a look at those links uh, in the, in, that's been posted in the chat. Um, even a couple of dollars will, will help save some lives in Tonga of some people that, that really need our help right now. Right now. All right. Good night, guys. Love you all. Not, I'm, night. I'm, Thank I'm, you. I'm, I'm going to be heading off for the night. So uh, if people don't hear from me, it's probably because I'm passed out. Okay. And thank you again. Thank you, Mania, for, for there. Thank you, Dapper. Bye. It was a, oh, it's a You're pleasure welcome. to have you on there. And people should check out your show, too, because you do an amazing show with, with a bunch of stuff, particularly some of those alleged thesis chapters you've been Yeah, the you know. uh, this Saturday, there should be more uh, thesis reading from the Kent Hovind uh, his alleged doctoral thesis, which my favorite part so far is one of his citations, of which there are very few, was KJV get book title. That was the citation. <laughs> oh, oh, dear. Yeah, it's it's oh, kind dear. of amazing. Oh, dear. Thank you again for, for uh, Jason. Check out his Patreon as well. So, so uh, good stuff. Good night, all. Good night.